the merciless fight for this remote city broke the German army's initiative. Hitler, at that time, tried to minimize it. You may be convinced that no one shall evict us from this place. We had to get here because this city was the enemy's largest supply base. The city had to be taken, and we did take it. Of course, we are modest. We took only what we needed and left out a few spots. Why haven't they been taken yet? Because I do not want to create another Verdun. I want to complete this action by using small shock troops. But the shock troops who won were those wearing the Red Star. Stalingrad never fell. Here are some films taken by Russian cameramen during the height of the battle. Hundreds of people died for each block, each house, each cellar. Hitler's Sixth Army, or rather what was left of it, and its commander, Field Marshal von Paulus, on their way to the prison camps. By that time, the generals knew that Hitler had misused them and their men, but too late. A few months after Stalingrad, German prisoners are led through Moscow's Red Square in the war's most appalling parade. These are newsreels never previously shown in the West. Now, millions of fathers, brothers, and sons go to Russian prison camps. Even today, millions are still missing. They were the victims of a group of criminals and maniacs who had promised heaven and delivered hell, who had exploited and soiled the good name of an entire nation. Stalingrad's tragic fate was again conjured up at Nuremberg. Field Marshal von Paulus is at the witness stand, being interrogated by his lawyer. And I can say that Sie, trotz Ihrer schweren Bedenken und Kenntnis der Tatsachen, die den Krieg gegen Russland als Angriffskrieg und Verbrechen. Although you believed that the war against Russia was an aggressive war, was a criminal assault. Why did you still think it was your duty as a soldier to carry out orders that meant trying to hold Stalingrad to the last man? I've already explained that when I assumed command, I was unaware of the full extent of the crimes that started and prolonged this war of aggression. I did not then recognize the full extent of those crimes and the intensity with which they were carried out. In one case, however, the guilt was never established. This was the question of who killed those thousands of Polish officers found in the mass graves of Khartoum. Was it the Germans, or was this done earlier? By the Russians. During this phase of the trial, statement stood against statement. By now, the tables had turned. But Hitler, the greatest warrior of all time, as he called himself, had lost all sense of perspective. His private life, however, remained unchanged. Here are some late snapshots from the Führer's album. His shepherd dogs. To the right, SS leader Himmler. Heydrich, called the Butcher of Prague. Dr. Goebbels, rushing to see his Führer.
He lived in style at his bear cove. Ribbon truck. A bus for Ava Brown. She was his sweetheart and became his wife. She died with him on their wedding day. Ava Brown was always eager to please. Few people knew her. But for those who did, she always liked to show off her shape. In fact, she frequently liked to show nothing but her shape. These pictures were taken by the Fuhrer himself in one of his more artistic moves. Children now were taken from their parents to become the wards of the regime. Political education started with the Nazi kindergarten, continued on to the Hitler Youth, a road which finally for thousands of 14-year-old boys led to imprisonment or to the grave. Hitler's gang had no consideration for human life for human dignity. They submitted to him as willing tools of his orders. Even in the face of impending defeat, they thought about little else but how to prolong their power, to make their lives pleasant. Yet everywhere, the German armies were retreating. Everywhere, the population was pressed to help in the last ditch defenses. Every day, the front came closer to the homeland. Desperately, Goebbels once more tried to whip up the masses. At Berlin's Sportpalast, he proclaims total war. And thus, I shall ask you a question, a question which you must answer for the entire German people, for the entire world, and especially for the enemy who at this hour is listening to the radio. The British maintain that the German people have lost belief in final victory. And so I ask you, do you want total war? Goebbels had been the spellbinder of the masses. The propaganda minister organized collections for charity, toys for children, and press conferences. He controlled every phase of radio, film, and press. The German public was permitted to hear, to see, to learn only what he wanted them to know. He was a skillful director of mass spectacles. Here, he's giving a mass party for SS leader Scorzini after Scorzini had abducted Mussolini from the prison where the Italian people finally had placed him. Scorzini is permitted to distribute medals. For Goebbels, this is a welcome opportunity to instill new fighting spirit in the laggard masses. In July 44, to stave off complete destruction, a desperate attempt was organized to assassinate Hitler. Hitler was wounded, but survived. Here at his headquarters, he receives the congratulations of his collaborators. This is Walter Funk, later one of the defendants at Nuremberg. The chief of his chancellery, Heinrich Lammers, later a Nuremberg witness. General Schoner, the German army's dreaded provost marshal. Goering. Once more, Goebbels. To the right, Hitler's brother-in-law, Fegelein, 
Hitler had him executed during the last days of the war. Like all military leaders, Admiral Dönitz, who during the last days had been designated as Hitler's successor, disclaimed all responsibility. His lawyer. Were you politically active before 1933? My first political activity took place on May 1st, 1945, when I became the head of the German state. Never before. Ammunition still felt that the Germans nearly won the war. Under a dictatorship, there are always a number of basic omissions which arise from the lack of permissible criticism. It was due to these that by 1942, we didn't have twice as many tanks, planes, and U-boats. A few basic omissions. Actually, Hitler had completely underestimated the enormous potential of his adversaries. He had never believed the United States would come into the war. In the summer of 1944, the Allies, with unprecedented masses of men and materiel at their disposal, had started the invasion of France. They came by sea, by air. They came by fleets of amphibious vessels. Parachuted from the air, the skies were dark with their planes and gliders. Division landed after division, army after army. Soon, the German defenses gave way. The Atlantic Wall was broken. The road to Paris was free. And then Paris was liberated. Parisians wanted to take part. Now the hunted turn into the hunter. Resistance fighters are searching Paris for the remnants of the German occupation troops.
This now is a different victory parade over the Champs-Élysées. It's General de Gaulle's big day. Last acts of despair by the German high command. The sluice gates are opened to flood wide areas of the Netherlands. Crimes to no avail. In eastern France, the people are rising. The Maquis are calling for the last fight. One year before, the French village of Oradour was burned to the ground by SS troops, its inhabitants murdered. Acts like this fanned the strength and fury of the resistance movement. bodies of the victims were excavated. Some of the SS murderers were caught at the time of the liberation, but the real instigators were tried at Nuremberg. Now the Allies control the air all over Germany. When the war had started, Goering mockingly declared that he would change his name into Herr Meyer if a single Allied plane penetrated German soil. Now he is Meyer. The remnants of his air force are being destroyed when and wherever they meet the Allies. Hitler had boasted of his miracle weapons, but they were too few, too hastily developed. Here is a V-1, a guided missile on its way to London. This one never reached its goal. Others were caught by the aircraft defenses. The V-2 rocket. but many had trouble leaving the ground. Here are Mussolini and Hitler in their heydays meeting at the Brenner Pass to cement what was called the Rome-Berlin Axis. But now Mussolini is dead. Killed by the partisans, he has been hung up by his feet in a Milan filling station alongside his mistress. And this is Winston Churchill, the man who had promised his people nothing but blood, sweat, and tears, and who finally reaped the victory. So the war enters Germany.
American troops in Cologne. They have reached the Rhine. Trimbachen, an attempt to blow up the Rhine Bridge had failed. Now the Allied troops are pouring over it. Troops reach Frankfurt and Stuttgart. Still the whole world to prove that Deutschland not only on the front, but also We want to prove to the entire world that Germany, not only at the front, but everywhere else in the homeland, has an army of dedicated men, is imbued with a strong and unshakable will, never to lower our colors before the enemies of the Reich, never to capitulate. Die Flagge zu streichen und Feige zu kapitulieren. Aber überall an der Front und in der Everywhere, at the front, at home, the German people have proven that they are a nation of men and, if necessary, also of determined women, and not a nation of frightened weaklings. Und nicht eine Nation von feigen Männern. But the white flags came out just the same. Only Berlin is still being defended. The remnants of the German armies are fighting against the Russian spearheads. Hitler sits deep down in the bunker of his chancellery, waits for the miracle to happen. He has given orders never to capitulate. Around his refuge, the former capital disintegrates into shambles. And it is only with his suicide that he concedes defeat. It was the end of his thousand year right. Once more, the roads are filled with the millions and millions of homeless. The catastrophe strikes guilty and innocent alike. A new army of refugees converges on what has been left of what was once greater Germany. He who sows the wind will reap the whirlwind.
During the Nazi regime, 10 million people throughout Europe were persecuted, tortured, and finally killed because of their race, their religion, their political attitudes. The secret scene of those crimes were the concentration camps. Goering had first established them. I personally supervised them until the spring of 1934. There were only two or three in all of Prussia. Of course, occasionally, some of the prisoners were slapped. Slapped? Here is General Eisenhower being shown a block on which thousands of prisoners were clubbed to death. For the first time, the world perceived events which would have defied human imagination. At Bergen-Belsen, British troops discovered the bodies of 12,000 victims still unburied. 13,000 lay dying. These movies were shown to the accused in Nuremberg. They looked away. These specialists in mass destruction were forever inventing new means of mass murder. To the outside world, they posed as humanitarians. During the winter, they took to the streets, shaking boxes to help the poor. Love thy neighbor, they proclaimed. But at the camps, those neighbors were tortured with passion and killed with detachment. Many prisoners were used as human guinea pigs. concentration camps, where the inmates were killed on the gallows or by lethal injections. Conveyor belts to the crematories for those killed in the gas chambers. Auschwitz alone, three million Jews were asphyxiated. Nuremberg became a parade of ceaseless horror. Tattooed concentration camp inmates were killed and their tan skins used as parchment for lampshades and other souvenirs for the guards. Some camp doctors, as a hobby, tried their skill at head shrinking. In charge of the death camps was SS leader Kaltenbrunner. I issued only one order to the Mauthausen camp, to surrender the entire camp, intact with all its prisoners, and without any abuse to the enemy. Here, some of Kaltenbrunner's gang. A camp commander. Concentration camp doctors. Female SS guards in charge of some of the women prisoners. Special killing squads. Thank you. 
Once again, Hitler and Himmler, to whom this organization was directly responsible. The guards themselves had been graduates of Hitler's private army. For him, they were to form the nucleus of a new master race. For him, Jews, Russians, Poles, and others belonged to a subhuman species that had to be extinguished without any trace of pity and compassion. Himmler and his illusions went so far as to plan to permit each SS officer and war hero to marry two wives to improve the race. Kaltenbrunner, as to be expected, never repented. I only know that I've given my life's work to my people, to my belief in Adolf Hitler. If in my activity, in a mistaken sense of duty, I committed errors such errors become inconsequential if compared to the powerful stream of our common fate. Finally, after 400 sessions which disclosed crimes never before tried in any court in the history of mankind, the evidence had been compiled. Before judgment is pronounced, however, the accused are permitted to make their final statements. Will they declare themselves guilty? Will they continue to deny their participation? Will they try to put the blame on others? Listen to the former Supreme Commander of the Wehrmacht, General Keitel. I have erred, and I was unable to prevent what ought to have been prevented. This is my guilt. This is my guilt. It is tragic to be forced to understand that the very best which I had to offer as a soldier, obedience and loyalty to my country was misused for intentions whose ultimate aim I didn't know. And that I did not understand, that there are limits even to a soldier's duty. This is my fate. That is my schicksal. Labor boss Saukel, in his final plea, turns sentimental. Under no conditions would I, as a German worker, and acting on behalf of the German workers, have consented to help prepare the insane scheme of an aggressive war. God protect my beloved people, and may he give peace to the world. In freedom. A thousand years shall pass and will not take away this guilt from Germany, said Hans Frank, former general governor of Poland. But Franz von Papen, in his final plea, attacks the British prosecutor. What gives Sir Hartley Shawcross the right to say with irony, mockery, and derision that I preferred to reign in hell instead of serving in heaven? Albert Speer, who during the last months of the war recognized the inevitable collapse, warned humanity. When aber ein moderner Industriestaat seine Intelligenz if a modern industrial state for a certain number of years uses its intelligence, its scientists, its technological means of production for the exclusive purpose of forging ahead in the armaments race, the likelihood arises that such a state, even with a small population, can gain a chance for world conquest, especially if during the same period other nations are using their technology for the cultural advancement of their people. Ihre technischen Fähigkeiten für den kulturellen Fortschritt der Menschheit verwendeten. Balder von Schirach. It was my guilt that I educated Germany's youth in the spirit of a man who was a murderer of millions. Baron von Neurath, who had wasted a good name for a very bad cause. So werde ich auch das zu tragen wissen und auch I shall accept my verdict, shall consider it as the last personal sacrifice for my people whom to serve was the core and the meaning of my life.
And here is Hans Fritzsche, formerly the chief commentator for the German radio network. Ich möchte die große Chance des letzten Schlussworts in diesem bedeutsamen Prozess nicht verschwenden mit der Aufzählung von Einzelheiten. I don't want to waste this great chance of this final plea to lose myself in details. Well, you gentlemen did not expect anything good to come from Hitler, and you were struck by the extent of what really happened. But try to understand the feeling of those who did expect good to come from Hitler, and who then found out how their good faith, their good will, their idealism was grossly abused. And your idealism was misused. Ich befinde mich in dieser Lage des Getäuschten. I find myself in the position of the bitterly disappointed man, together with many, many other Germans about whom the prosecutor says that they should have been able to recognize what happened by looking at the smoking chimneys of the concentration camps or by just looking at the pale faces of the prisoners. There is breathless silence in the courtroom as the president of the court starts to read the verdicts of a trial which has lasted eight months. Here are some. Ribbentrop. Death by hanging. Keitel. Death by hanging. Goering. Death by hanging. The trial has ended. Those condemned to die start their road to the gallows. Like Karl Hermann Frank, the former deputy protector of Bohemia and Moravia. Like the other war criminals who had drawn Europe in a sea of blood and tears, and who had blackened the name of Germany. Behind them, the corpses of 26 million men, women, and children. The sorrow of the cripples, of the homeless, of the widows and orphans, of an entire nation that over a span of 12 years had excluded herself from the community of mankind. The Nuremberg trials disclosed the full extent of the German tragedy. It showed to what depths man can lower himself. May the powers of this world be vigilant that such a catastrophe does not happen again.